Hey everybody and welcome back. I'm sure as you know by now we are getting on to chapter 10 of Anne McCaffrey's Dragon Singer. I've started recording a little later in the day today just because I wanted to make sure they weren't still going to be coming in for the fire alarm tests that they were supposed to do yesterday. I've heard a couple of voices out in the hallway. Nothing big. There's been no fire alarms going off, so I'm pretty darn certain this is going to be put off for at least another week. Yeah. However, my boss contacted me this morning and goes, So, are you coming to work today uh, for your shift? And my response was, Well, the ER told me to be off until Friday. So I won't be able to come back until Sunday, which is my next regular shift. And then my boss was like, oh yeah, I forgot. I'm sorry. He, it's been a very, very crazy week with work. Um, uh, I was saying on the last video or the video before that, I can't remember which, well, well, uh, I had already said something about the snow, but uh, we, he ended up having even more people call out uh, bef since that video. And he's already had a few people for today because they're calling for even more snow. This should be starting soon. Yesterday, for those of you who were in the U.S., we got a foot of snow. Yeah, about a foot of snow. Uh, here... Canada, other places, 30 centimeters, and we're calling for more, and apparently there was a layer of ice over the top of it when my husband was driving home from work. Even he got stuck on a hill, uh, but he uh, then quantified that with saying, nobody else had gone up it, I was just going to try. <laughs> He didn't think he was going to make it either. He kind of did it on purpose to see if our vehicle would get stuck. Because it was easy to back out and get back onto the main drag. Because there was very little very little vehicles out on the road. And he kind of had fun doing it. So. <laughs> Thankfully, I don't have to go out until tomorrow. And then when I get back home, I'm going to spend the day editing chapters Eight, nine, ten, and eleven. That's my goal. That'll take me probably until I have to go back to work on Sunday. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sure you noticed that I'm wearing my Sonic screwdriver shirt again. Yes, this is one of my favorites. Yes, it's clean. All the fun stuff. I just enjoy it. And because I do a lot of recording ahead, it allows me time to uh, get back to shirts. So this chapter, I think, is going to be uh, about as long as the last one, which I think, well, I haven't edited it yet, uh, but I think it's going to be about an hour and a half. That's my guess. But I could be very wrong. Happens all the time. Whew. Ugh, don't like this angle. Oh well. Too bad. But I've got to start working out again. Get some of this job off. But that's me. All right, let's get on to the next chapter of Anne McCaffrey's Dragon Singer. We're almost done. Soon we will have Dragon Drums. Depending on how long this takes me to record between the two chapters, I might do the first chapter of Dragon Drums today as well. Or I may not. It depends on how dry my mouth is by the end of this. Shh. 
Chapter 10 Then my feet took off, and my legs went too, and my body was obliged to follow, me with my hands and my mouth full of cress, and my throat too dry to swallow. Melanie's Running Song To Melanie's intense relief, all Lord Garrosh did want to talk about was the fire lizards, his in particular and in general. The four of them, Robinton, Siebel, Lord Garrosh, and herself, sat at a table apart from the others on one side of the square, each of them had with a fire lizard. Melanie was torn between amusement and awe that she, the newest of all newest of apprentices, should be in such exalted company. Lord Garrosh, for all of his clipped speech and amazing range of descriptive grimaces, was very easy to talk to. Once she got over her initial nervousness about the uh, fracas with Bennis. She heard in detail about the hatching of Murga, smiled when Lord Garage guffawed reminiscently over his early anxieties about her. Could you use someone with your knowledge, girl? You forget, sir, that my friends broke shell about the same time Murga did. I wouldn't have been much help to you then. You can be now, though. How do I go about teaching Murga to fetch and carry for me? Heard about your pipes. She's just the one. It took all nine of mine to bring me the pipes. They're heavy. Melanie considered the problem, seeing the disappointment on Lord Garage's features. For Murga alone, it would have to be something light, like a message, and you'd have to want it very badly. It was, well, my feet still hurt, and it was such a long walk to the cot. Get a break. Um, look, people want to see you. Can't miss out on a beautiful skitter. His eyes, which were disconcertingly light brown, fixed on hers. Gotta want it badly, huh? Humph. Don't know if I want anything badly. He gave a snort of laughter at her expression. You want things badly when you're young, girl. When you're my age, you've learned how to plan. He winked at her. Take the point, though. Since Murga's a bundle of emotion, aren't you? Aren't you, pet? He stroked her head with a remarkably tender touch for a big, heavy-fingered man. Emotion. That's what they respond best to. Wants sort of an emotion, isn't it? If you want something bad enough... Th Humph. He laughed again, this time with an oblique look at the Harper. Emotion, then, Harper. Not knowledge is what these little beasts, beasties communicate. Emotion, like Brecky's fear the other night. Hatching's emotional, too. And today, he turned his light eyes back to Melanie. Today, that was all my fault, sir, Melanie said, grabbing a remark of Pimer's for excuse. My friend Pimer, the little fellow, and Melanie measured Pimer's height from the ground with her, with her free hand, stumbled in the crowd. 
I'm afraid he'd be trampled. Was that what that was all about, Robington? asked Lord Garrosh. You never did explain. But Lord Garrosh seemed more interested in the lack of wine in his cup. Robington politely topped the cup from the wine skin on the table. It never occurred to me, Lord Garrosh, said Melanie with genuine concentration, that I'd be alarming you or the Master Harper or Siebel. The young of every kind tend to be easily alarmed, remarked the Harper, but Melanie could see the corners of his mouth twitching with amusement. The problem will disappear with maturity. And increases now with so many fire lizards about her, added Lord Garrosh with a grunt. How much more do you think they'll grow, girl, if yours are the same age as Murga? He was frowning at beauty and glancing back to Murga. Miriam's three fire lizards at Brendan Ware were from the first clutch, weren't they? They're not much more than a fingertip longer, said Melanie, eagerly sizing on the, seizing on the new topic. They'd be older by several seven days, I think. She glanced at the Master Harper, who nodded in confirmation. When I first saw Fenor's queen growl, I thought it was my beauty. Beauty squeaked indignantly, her eyes whirling a little faster. Only for a moment, Melanie told her in apology and stroked Beauty's head. And only because I didn't know the wares had discovered the fire lizards. Any notion how old they must be to mate? as Lord Garrosh, scrowling in hopes of favorable answer. Sir, I don't know. To Gellion, Monoroth's rider is going to keep a watch on the cave where my fire lizards hatched to see if their queen will come back to clutch there again. Cave? I thought fire lizards laid their eggs in sand on the beaches. Master Robington indicated that she was to speak freely to the Lord Holder. So Melanie told him how she'd seen fire, the fire lizard queen mating near the dragon stones. How she happened to be back that way looking for spider claws. Good eating those, Lord Garage agreed and gestured for her to get on with the tail, and helped the little fire lizard queen lift the eggs from the sea-threatened strand into the cave. You wrote that song, didn't you? Lord Grosh's frown was surprised and approving. The one about the fire lizard keeping the sea back with her wings. Liked that one. Right more like it. Easy to sing. Why didn't you tell me a girl wrote it, Robinton? His scrowl was now accusatory. I didn't know about Me it was Melanie at the time we circulated the song. Oh, forgot about that. Go on, girl. Did it happen just as you wrote the song? Yes, sir. How come you were there in the cave when they hatched? I was hunting spider claws and went farther down the coast than I should have. Threadfall was due. I was caught out, and the only shelter I could think of was the cave where I'd put the fire lizard eggs. I arrived with my sack of spider claws just as the eggs began to break. 
That's how I impressed so many. I couldn't very well let them fly out into the thread. And they were so hungry, just out of the shell. Lord Garrosh grunted, sniffed and mumbled to the effect that he had had enough trouble keeping one fed. His compliments for landing, his compliments for handling nine, as if to mention, as if the mention of food had penetrated their sleep. Kimmy and Zare roused, creeling. I mean no discourtesy, Lord Garrosh," said Master Robington, rising as hastily as Siebel. Nonsense! Don't go. They'll eat anything, anywhere. Lord Grosh swung his heavy torso about. You there, what's your name? And he waved impatiently at the wineman's apprentice who came running. Bring a tray of those meat rolls from the stalls. A big tray. Ha heaped. Enough to feed two hungry fire lizards and a couple of harpers. Never knew a harper who wasn't hungry. Are you hungry, Har harper girl? No, sir. Thank you, sir. Making a liar out of me, harper girl. Bring back some bubbly pies, too. The Lord Holder roared after the departing apprentice. Hope you heard me. So you are the daughter of two Yanis of Half Circle Seahold. Melanie nodded an acknowledgement of the relationship. Never been to Half Circle. They brag about that cavern of theirs. Does it hold the fishing fleet? Yes, sir, it does. The biggest can sail in without unstepping the mass. Except, of course, when the tides run exceptionally high. There's a rock shelf for repairs and uh, carrying, a section for building, as well as a very dry inside cave for storing wood. Hold above the docking cavern. Lord Grosh seemed dubious about the wisdom of that. Oh, no, sir. Half Circle Seahold really is a half circle. She cocked her thumb and curved her forefinger. This, and she angled her right hand to show the direction of the curve after squinting to see where the sun was. My thumb is the docking cavern, and this, she pointed to the length of her forefinger, is the hold the longer part of the half circle. And then this much, she touched the webbing, is a sandy beach. They can draw dinghies up on it or gut fish, sew nets and mend sails there in fair weather. They? asked Lord Garrosh, his thick eyebrows rising in surprise. Yes, sir, they. I'm a harper now. Well said, Melanie, replied Lord Garrosh, slapping his thigh with a crack that made Murga squeal in alarm. Girl or not, Robington, you've got a good one here. I approve. I approve. Thank you, Lord Garrosh. I was confident you would, said the Master Harper with a slight smile, which he shared with Siebel before he nodded reassuringly at Melanie. Beauty chirped a question, which Lord Garrosh's Murda answered with a sort of, that's that tone. Cross crafting works, Robington. Think I'll have to spot a few more of my sons about. Sea holds too. The notion of Venice in Half Circle Sea Hold appealed to Melanie, though she didn't know if that was whom Lord Garrosh had in mind. The slap of running feet 
and a hoarse breathing interrupted the conversation as the apprentice lad, juggling two trays, all but slid the contents into their laps of those he served. As the new fire lizards were fed, Melanie saw more and more people were filing into the central square, taking seats at tables and benches. At one end was a wooden platform. Now a group of harpers took their places and began to tune up. Immediately sets were formed for a call dance. A tall journeyman harper gave his tambourine a warning shake and then called out to the dance figures in a loud voice that carried above the music while his tambourine emphasized the step rhythm. Watch, th those watching on the sidelines clapped in time to the music, shouting good-natured encouragement to the dancers. To Melanie's surprise, Lord Grush added a hearty smacking beat of his hands, stamping his feet and cheerfully grinning about at everyone. Once the music started, the square filled up and still more benches were angled into any free space. Melanie saw colors of all the major crafts on the journeymen and apprentices from the halls of the Fort Holt complex. Groups of men stood about drinking wine and watching the dancing. Their heavy boots and clean, though earth-stained trousers, marking them as small holders in from the neighboring farms for the rest day and a bit of trading at the gather. Their woman folk had congregated along one side of the square, chattering, tending smaller children, watching the dancing. When the sets changed, some of the holders dragged their giggling but willing women out to make up a new group, make up new groups as the musicians began another foot tapping, hand clapping tune. The third was a couple's dance, a wild gyration of swinging arms and skipping legs an excuse that rendered every participant breathless and thirsty to judge by the calls on the winemen's la lads when the dance ended. A change of harpers occurred now, the dance players giving up the platform to brood again and three of the older apprentices who arranged themselves slightly behind brood again at his signal, they sang the song that Elgion had sung the night of his arrival at Half Circle Seahold. It was one Melanie had never had the chance to learn. She leaned forward, eager to catch every word and chord. On her shoulder, Beauty sat up one forepaw lightly clasping Melanie's ear for balance. The little queen gave a trill and glanced inquiringly at Melanie. Let her sing, said Master Robington. Then he leaned forward. But if you can keep the others where they are on the roofs, I think that might be wise. Melanie said a sent a firm command to her friends, just as Murga rose to her haunches on Lord Garrosh's shoulder and added her voice to beauties. As the fire lizard's descant rose above the harper's voices, Melanie was conscious of being the focus of the startled attention. Lord Garrosh was beaming with pride, a smug smile on his face. 
the fingers of one hand drumming the beat on the table while he waved the other as if he were directing the ex exempius chorus. Wild applause filed the, followed the song with cries of the fire lizard song, sing the queen's song. Does she know it? Fire lizard. From the platform, Brudigan beckoned imperiously to Melanie. Go on, girl. What's holding you back? Lord Garrosh flicked his fingers at her to obey the summons. Want to hear you sing it. You wrote it. Ought to sing it. Shake yourself up, girl. Never heard a harper not wanting to sing. Melanie appealed to Master Robington, but the harper had a wicked twinkle in his eyes, despite the bland expression on his face. You heard Lord Garrosh, Melanie, and it's time you did a turn as a harper. She heard the emphasis on the last word. He, he rose, holding out his hand to her, as if he knew very well how nervous she was. She'd have no choice now, for to refuse would be to shame him, slight the hall, and annoy Lord Garrosh. I'll accompany you, Melanie, if I may. You do remember the new wording, Robington asked, as he handed her up to the platform. She mumbled a hasty affirmative and then wondered if she did. She hadn't actually sung the new words or the tune, for that matter, since she'd composed it so very long ago in the little hall in Half Circle Hold. But there was Brood again, in grinning a welcome and gesturing to two guitar players to hand over their instruments to her and the Master Harper. Melanie turned and saw all the faces, all the people massed on each side of the square. A hush fell, and into that attentive silence, the harper struck the first chords of her fire lizard song. Master Shonagar's oft-replaced advice flashed through her mind. Stand straight, take your breath into your guts, shoulders back, open your mouth, and sing. The little queen all golden flew hissing at the sand to stop each wave her clutch to save. She ventured bravely. The applause that greeted the final verse of the song was so deafening that beauty rose on wing, squealing with surprised alarm. Then the crowd laughed and gradually the noise subsided. Sing something from your sea hold, said the master harper in her ear as she played a few idle chords. Something these landsmen might not have heard. You'll, you start, we'll follow. The crowd was noisy and Melanie wondered how she'd be heard. But as soon as she struck the first notes, the, the gather quieted. She used the course for introduction, giving the master harper the courting, and smiling even as she sang to find herself so well accompanied. O oh, white sea, O oh, sweet sea, forever be my lover. Fare me on your gentle wave, your wide bed over. Over the applause when she finished, she heard the Master Harper saying right in her ear, They've never heard that one before. Good choice. 
He bowed, gestured for her to take a bow, then motioned to the harpers waiting just behind beyond the platform to start the second group dance. Smiling and waving to various people, he led Melanie from the platform and back to the table where Lord Garrosh was still enthusiastically clapping. Siebel grinned approvingly and rose to pass back to the Master Harper, the very irritated little Zare. Melanie would have preferred to sit down and recover from the surprise of her first public appearance as a harper and the warmth of the reception, but Talmor came up. You've done your duty by the craft hall now, Melanie. Let's dance. He spied beauty on her shoulder. But could she sit this one out? No telling how she'd misconstrue my manhandling of you in a dance. The Harpers had already struck a fast prance tune. Will she stay with me? asked Siebel, offering his arm and a padded sleeve. Zare didn't mind too much. Melanie coaxed Beauty, who chattered with annoyance, but allowed herself to be transferred to Siebel's shoulder. Talmor, one arm about Melanie's waist, swung her expertly and quickly into the whirling dancers. After that, it seemed to Melanie that she'd no more than time to take a quick sip of wine to moisten her parched throat and reassure Beauty before she was claimed by another partner. Viterin took her for the next set dance, with Talmor partnering a diva in the same group. Then Brudigan caught her hand for a dance, and, to her complete surprise, Dominic after him. She acceded to Pimer's boast that he could dance as well as any journeyman and master, and wasn't he her best friend, despite a lack of hands in height and turns in age? Quarters of singers spelled the dance players until Melanie was certain that every single harper must have performed. Both of the songs that Pedron had sent to the harper were so frequently requested that Melanie writhed a bit with embarrassment until Siebel caught her eye, cocked in, uh, cocking an eyebrow and grinning at her discomfort. As full dark settled over Fort Hold, the crowd began to thin for those with a distance to travel had to start their journeys home. Stalls were taken down and folded away. The grazing herd beasts and runners were captured and saddled to bear their owners down the roads from the hold. The wine man, since he kept a hold in the fort cliff, continued to serve those unwilling to end a gather. Pecking Melanie urgently on the cheek, Beauty reminded her that the fire lizards had been politely waited for their supper long enough. Abashed at her thoughtlessness, Melanie rushed to the harbor hall. On the kitchen steps, Camo sat disconsciently, his thick arms cradling an enormous bowl of scraps his eyes on the archway. The instant he caught sight of her and the fire lizards wheeling and diving as escort, he rose, calling to her, Pretty hungry? Pretty's very hungry. Camel waiting. Camel hungry too. From nowhere, Pimer appeared. See, Camel, I told told you she'd be back. 
I told you she'd want us to feed her fire lizards. Pimer stopped her breathless apologies as he handed out gobs of meat to his usual trio. Told you gathers were fun, didn't I, Melanie? Told you it was about time you had some, too. And you sang just great. You should always sing the fire lizard song they loved it and how come we don't know that sea song it's got a great rhythm that's an old song i've never heard it melody laughed because pimer sounded as testy as an old uncle instead of a half-grown boy Hope you know some of the some more new ones like that because I'm so bored with all the stuff I've heard since I was a babe. Hey, you had the last piece, lazy. It's Mimic's turn. There, behave yourself. The fire lizards made short work of Camo's bowl. Then Ranley leaned out of the dining room windows, urging them to come and eat before the food was cleared away. There weren't many in the dining hall. Pimer had been right that they got scanty rations on a gather day. But the cheese, bread, and sweetlings were all Melanie could eat. When the apprentice master marshaled the younger ones to the dormitory, Melanie quietly ascended the steps to her own room. The lilting strain of still another dance tune drifted on the night air. She'd done her first turn as a harper and done well. She felt like a harper for the first time, as if she really did belong here in the hall. Lulled by the music and the distant laughter, she fell asleep, the warm bodies of the fire lizards nestling against her. The next morning, looking from her window to the place where the gather had been held, she saw a few traces of litter only the dew-glistening, trampled earth of the dancing square. Holders trudged towards the fields. Herdsmen were guiding their beasts to the meadows, and apprentices dashing up and down the holdway on their errands. Down the ramp from Fort Hold paced a troop of laggy runners, fresh after a day's rest fretting against the slow pace to which the riders held them until they were past the ambling herd beasts. They disappeared in a cloud of dust down the long road to the east. Melanie heard the noise from the apprentice's dormitories and a soft, all but inaudible, creeling closer by. She threw on her clothes and dashed down the steps. I knew you wouldn't miss, Melanie, said Sylvina, meeting her on the steps from the kitchen. She carried a tray, which she thrust ahead. Do take this up to the harbor like a pet, would you? Camo's just about finished wielding that chopper of his for your fare. Melanie's polite tap at the Master Harper's door brought an instant response. He had a fur clutched around him and an, intent, and an insistently creeling fire lizard clawing at his bare arm. How do you know? he asked, delighted and relieved to see her. Thank goodness you did. I really can't appear in the kitchen wrapped in a sleeping fur. There, there, I'm stuffing your face, you bottomless pit. 
How long does this insatiable appetite continue, Melanie? She held the tray for him so he could feed Zare as they crossed the room. She slid the tray into the middle of the sand table, anticipating the harper's own requirements. Offered Zare his next few pieces of meat while Master Robington gratefully gulped down steaming claw. He grabbed a piece of bread, dipped it into the sweeting, and had another sip of claw, and then, his mouth full, waved at Melanie to leave. You've got your own to feed, too. Don't forget to work on your song. I'll require a finished copy later this morning. She nodded and left him, wondering if she ought to check and see if Siebel was managing with Kimmy. He was seated at one of the journeyman's tables with more than enough willing assistance. Her fire lizards waited patiently at the kitchen steps with Primer and Camo. Once her friends had been fed, she was enjoying a second cup of claw when Dominic came striding across the court towards her. Melanie, and he was frowning with irritation. I know Robington wants you to finish that song for him, but will it take all morning? I wanted you to go through the quartet music with Siebel, Talmer, and myself. Marshall has the girls for theory on first day, so Talmor's free. I'll never get that quartet ready for performance unless we have a few more good rehearsals. I'll start the copy right now, only... Only what? I don't have any copying tools. Is that all? Finish your claw quickly. I'll show you an oar's den. Just as well I'm taking you, Dominic said, guiding her towards the door in the opposite corner of the court. Robington wants the song done on those sheets of pulped wood, and a nor won't hand them out to apprentices. Master Anor, the hall's archivist, occupied the large room behind the main hall. It was brilliantly lit with glow baskets in each corner in the center of the room and smaller ones uh, depending above the tilted work tables where apprentices and journeymen bent to tasks of copying faded record hides and newer songs. Master Ernor was a fosser. He wanted to know why Melanie was to have sheets. Apprentices had to learn how to copy properly on old hide before they could be entrusted with the precious sheets. What was all the hurry about? And why hadn't Master Robington told him himself it it was all this important. And a girl? Yes, yes, he'd heard about Melanie. He'd seen her in the dining hall. Same as he saw all the other nuisance apprentices and holder girls and, oh well, all right. Here was tool and ink, but she wasn't to waste it now or he'd have to make more. And that was a lengthy process, and apprentices never paid close attention to the simmering. And if the solution boiled, it would be ruined and faded too soon. And, oh, he didn't know what the world was coming to. The journeyman had been unobtrusively assembling the various items and he handed them to Melanie, giving her an amused wink for his master's querulousness. His smile also conveyed to Melanie the tip that, that the next time 
he should she should come directly to him rather than approach the cranky master. Dominic got her away from the old archivist after the barest of courtesies. As they walked back to the hall entrance, he again directed her not to be all morning at that copying or he'd never get the new quartet sufficiently rehearsed before the festival. As he opened the door to the main hall, she heard the Master Harper's voice and sped up the stairs. As she worked in her room, her concentration was penetrated now and then by voices raised in discussion in the hall below. Absently, she identified the various masters, Dominic, Marshall, Durant, the Master Harper, and to her surprise, Sylvina, and others whose voices she couldn't recognize as readily. As the conversations apparently had to do with posting journeymen to various positions about the country, she paid scant heed. She was, in fact, just finishing the third and looser interpretation of the song when a brisk tapping at the door startled her so much she almost smeared the sheet. At her answer, Dominic strode in. Haven't you finished yet? She nodded to the sheets spread out to dry. Scrawling with exasperation, he strode across the room and picked up the newest sheet. Before she could warn him about the damp ink, she noticed that he took the sheet carefully by the edges. Hmm, yes, you copy neatly enough to please even old Anor. Yes, now, he was scanning the other sheets. Traditional forms all duly observed. Not a bad tune at all. He gave her an approving nod. Bit bare of chord, but the subject doesn't need musical embellishment. Come, come, finish that sheet too. He pointed to the one before her. Oh, you have. Fair enough. He blew gently across the, across the sheet to dry the last line of still glistening ink. Yes, that'll do. I'll just be off with these. Take your guitar across to my quarters, Melanie, and study the music on the rack. You're to play second guitar. Play, pay special attention to the dynamic qualities of the second variation. With that, he left her. Her right hand ached from the cramped position of copying, and she massaged it, then shook her fingers vigorously from the wrist to relieve the strain. Now, she heard the Master Harper's voice from the room below. The point is that all but one of the formalities has been observed. Admittedly, there's not been much time spent in the hall, but an apprenticeship served elsewhere under a competent journeyman has always been amissable. Does anyone wish to register any reservations about the competence of that journeyman? There was a short pause. So that's settled. Ah, yes. Thank you, Dominic. Now, Master Anor and Melanie lost the sound of his voice as he evidently moved away from the window. She was uncomfortably aware that she was not only an indervent eavesdropper on the craft matters, not her business, but disobedient to Master Dominic's orders. Not that she didn't wish to follow them. She picked up her guitar, playing with Talmor, Siebel and Dominic was a pure delight. 
Had Master Dominic meant to emanate the cheeky part of that quarter in a performance? Well, if yesterday was any sample of being a harper, yes, she probably would be performing in that quarter. New as she was to the Harper Hall. That was part of being a Harper, after all. When Melanie entered Dominic's quarters, Talmor and Siebel, Kim, uh, Kimmy deposited on his shoulder, and not looking too pleased to be shifted from the crook of his arm, were already discussing music. They greeted her cheerfully and asked if she enjoyed her... Uh, enjoyed the first go in the gather at Fort Hold. They both laughed at her enthusiastic replies. Everyone's better for a good gather, said Talmor. Except Marshall, said Siebel, and glancing sideways at Talmor as if they shared some secret, rubbing the side of his nose. Let's let us play, journeyman Siebel. Melanie thought the Talmor sounded reproving. By all means, journeyman Talmor said Siebel, not the least bit perturbed. If you will join us, apprentice Melanie. The brown man gestured elaborately for Melanie to take the stool beside him. As Melanie checked the tuning of her guitar, Telmore turned the sheets of music on the rack. Where does he want us to start? Master Dominic told me to study the dynamics of the second variation, said Melanie, with helpful def deference. That's right, that's where, said Telmore, snapping his fingers before he flipped the correct sheets to the front. At the beat, then. Sweet shells, he's changing the time in every third measure. What does he expect from us? Are the dynamics difficult? asked Melanie, feeling apprehensive. Not difficult, just Dominic all over, said Talmor with a sigh of the long suffering. But he tapped the appropriate beat on the wood of his guitar and gave a more empathic fifth beat for them to start. They had a chance to go through the second variation once before Dominic entered the room. Nodding courteously to them, he took his place. Let's start at the beginning of the second variation, now that you've had a chance to play it through. They worked steadily, going straight through the music once. The second time they paused frequently to perfect the more difficult passages and balance the parts. The dinner bell punctuated the brisk notes of the finale. Talmor and Siebel put down their instruments with small sighs of relief, but Melanie refingered the final three chords softly before she laid her instrument down. Does your hand hurt? asked Dominic with unexpected solitude. No, I was just wondering if the string was true. If you heard a sour sound, it was my stomach, said Talmor. Too much gathering? asked Siebel with little sympathy. No, not enough breakfast, thank you, replied Talmor with the brusqueness of someone being teased. He rose and left the room, followed closely by the silently laughing Siebel. Master Shonagar has you this afternoon, Melanie, asked Dominic, motioning for Melanie to come with him. Yes, sir. Well, then, you'd have to continue that voice instruction anyway, he said in a cryptic fashion. Melanie decided he must be wishing to have her practice with him more steadily. But Master Robington had been specific, 
her mornings were scheduled to Master Dominic. Afternoons, she was to go to Master Shonagar. When they entered the hall, the room was already well filled. Dominic turned to the, uh, to the right towards the master's table. Melanie caught one glimpse of Master Marshall, already seated, his face set in the sourest lines that she had yet seen on the bad-tempered old man. So she looked away, she looked quickly away. Pona's gone! Pimer pounced on her from the left. His, his face wreathed with smug satisfaction. So I can sit with you near the girls now. Adiva said I could, cause it was Pona who got snotty. Adiva says, will you please sit with her? Pona's gone. Melanie, both surprised and nervous, permitted Pimer to pull her towards the hearth side table. There were two empty places, one on either side of Adiva, who smiled hesitantly as she saw Melanie approaching. She beckoned to the seat on her right, away from the other girls. See, Pona's gone. She got taken away, Dr a dragon back. Pimer's, uh, Pimer added, his pleasure in her departure somewhat allayed by the prestigious manner of her going. Because of yesterday? A thin knot of worry in her middle grew larger and colder. Pona in the cot, contained by the discipline of the Harper Hall, was bad enough. But in her grandfather's hold, pouring out acid vengeance, she was much more dangerous for Harper apprentice Melanie. Nah, not just yesterday, Pimer said firmly, so don't you go feeling guilty about it. But yesterday was the final crack, the way I heard it, bearing false witness against you, and dunk us been raked over by Sylvina. That pleased her to no end. She's just been inching to take Dunka down. Timony was straddling three seats across from Ad Adiva and gesturing urgently to Melanie and Pimer to take them. You sit with Timony, Pimer. I'm going to sit next to Adiva. Looks like she's being put on by Barella with her empty seat and all. As she stepped into the place, she caught Barilla's startled, agonistic gl glance. The dark girl nudged her neighbor, Amania, who also turned to glare at Melanie. But Melanie smiled at Odiva, and as she stood by the tall craft girl, she felt Odiva's hand fumble for hers and the grateful pressure of her fingers, stealing a sideways glance, she noticed that Adiva's eyes looked red, and her cheeks allowed the puffiness of recent and prolonged weeping. The signal to be seated was given, and the meal began. If Melanie felt too self-conscious, and Adiva too upset to talk, Pimer suffered no inhibitions and babbled on about how he made his marks count. I got nine more bubbly pies, Melanie, he told her gaily, cause the baker thought they were for you, me, and Camo. I did share with Timmy, Timony, didn't I, Tim? And I won a wager on the runners. Anyone with half an eye could tell the one with the sore hoof would run faster so he wouldn't have to run so long. So how many marks did you come back with? 
Ha! Plymer's eyes flashed with triumph. More than I went to the gather with. And I'm not saying how much that is. You're not keeping them in the dorm, are you? Asked Timmy. Timmy worried. Ha! I gave it to Sylvina to keep safe from me. I'm no fool. And I told the entire dorm where my marks are. So they know it's no good putting on me to find out where I've hit them. I may be small, but my glow's not dim. Borelli, Borella, who was pretending to ignore them all, made a disagreeable sound. Pimer was about to take umbrage when Melanie kicked his shin to warn him to be silent. You know what, Melanie? And now Pimer leaned across the table extruding mystery as he glanced from her to a diva and Timony. They're posting journeymen. Are they? asked Melanie, mystified. You ought to know. Couldn't you hear anything in your room? I saw the windows of the main hall open and you're right over them. I was busy, Melanie said sternly to Pimer, and I was brought up not to listen to other people's private conversations. Pimer rolled his eyes in exasperation for such niceties. You'll never survive in the Harper Hall then, Melanie. You've got to be one to got to be one jump ahead of the masters and the lord holders a harper supposed to learn as much as he can learn yes over here no replied melanie and you're an apprentice added adiva an apprentice learns to be a harper by overhearing his master, doesn't he? demanded Pimer. Besides, I got to think ahead. I got to be good at something besides singing. My voice won't last forever. Do you realize that only one out of hundreds? And he waved his arms in such an expressive gesture that Timony had to duck. Of boy sopranos have any voice when they hit the change. So if I'm not lucky, but if I'm good at digging things out, maybe I'll get posted like Siebel and have a fire lizard to take important messages from hold to hall. Then Pimer froze and cautiously turned to look at Melanie, his eyes wide with consternation. She laughed. She couldn't help it. Timony, who, was who had obviously heard Pimer's long-raged plan before, gulped so fiercely that his neck cartilage bobbed up and down in his throat like a net floating in a fast current. I really do like the fire lizards, Melanie. I really do, said Pimer, trying to undo the indiscretion and reinstate himself in Melanie's good graces. She couldn't resist a pretense of disdain and ignored him. But his expression was so genuinely panic-stricken that she relented sooner than she intended. Pimer, you've been my best friend, best and first friend in the hall, and I really do think my fire lizards like you. Mimic, rocky, and lazy let you feed them. I may not be able to help, but if I do ever have any say in the matter, you'll get an egg 
from one of Beauty's clutches. Pimer's exaggerated sigh of relief attracted f attention from the other girls, who were still pretending that the end of the table didn't exist. Platters of stewed meats and vegetables were now being served, and Melanie took advantage of the general noise to ask Odiva how things were with her. All right, once the fur, uh, furor died down, I rank the rest of them, even if rank's not supposed to be a consideration while we're at the Harper Hall. You're also the best musician of the lot, said Melanie, trying to cheer Odiva. She sounded very depressed. And she must have been crying a lot to have such puffy cheeks. Do you really think I can play? asked Adiva, surprised and pleased. From what I heard that morning, yes. The others are hopeless. If there's no reason you have to stay at Dunka's when you have free time... Maybe you'd like to come to my room. We could practice together, if that would help. Me? Practice with you? Oh, Melanie, could I please? I really do want to learn, but all the others want to do is talk about the fosterlings at the hold, and their clothes, and who do their who their fathers are likely to choose as husbands for them, and I want to learn how to play well. Melanie extended her hand, palm up, and Odiva gratefully seized it, her eyes sparkling, all traces of her unhappiness erased. Just wait till I tell you what happened in the cot, she said in a confidential tone that reached only Melanie's ears. She saw Pimer cocking his head to try and hear and waved him away. It was a treat, a rare treat. What Sylvina said to Dunka, a diva giggled. But won't there be trouble about Pona being sent back? She is the granddaughter of the old hoarder, holder of bowl. Adiva's face clouded briefly. The harper has the right to say who stays in his own hall, replied Adiva quickly. He has equal rank with a lord holder. Who can dismiss any fosterling he chooses. Besides, you're a holder's daughter. Holders, not lord holders. I'm only an apprentice now, she touched her shoulder badge, which meant more to her than being her father's daughter. You're the master harper's apprentice, said Pimer who indeed had sharp ears if he had heard their whispers. And that makes you special. He glanced towards Berylia, who had been trying to overhear what Melanie and Odiva were saying. And you'd better remember that, Berylia, he said, making a fierce grimace at the dark girl. You may think you're special, Melanie, said Berylia in a haughty voice. But you're only an apprentice, after all said and sifted, and Pona's her grandfather's favorite. When she tells him all that's been going on here, you may not be that anymore. And she snapped her fingers in a dismissive gesture. Close your mouth, Barilla. You talk nothing but nonsense. And Adiva said Adiva. But Melanie caught the note of uncertainty in her voice. Nonsense! 
Just wait till you hear what Bennis plans for that Viridian of yours. They were all distracted by a sudden groan from Pimer. Shells! Kona has gone. That means that I'm stuck with the singing her part. What a ruddy bore! His dismay was comic, but it turned the talk to a discussion of the upcoming spring festival. Pimer told Melanie that if she thought a gather was fun, she should just wait for the festival. Everyone in the hold cliff doubled up so that the entire western half of Pern could be under shelter there for the two days of the festival. Dragon men came from all over, and harpers and craftmasters and holders, large and small. That's when any new craftmasters were made and new apprentices were tapped. And it was great fun, even if he would have to sing Pona's role. And there'd be dancing all night long instead of just until sundown. The gong sounded and the chores were assigned. Most of the sections were to clean up the gather area and rake the fields where the beasts had been tethered. Pimer made a huge grimace since his section drew the field duty. Berlia smiled maliciously at his charging, and he would have answered in kind, but Melanie towed his shins sharply again. He rolled his eyes at her, but when she cocked her head meaningfully and tapped her shoulder, he subsided, realizing that he would have to stay in her good record to get his fire lizard. She reported, as ordered, to Master Oldive, who checked her feet and pronounced them so a sound enough. He suggested that she see Sylvina about boots. Her hand showed improvement, but she was to be careful not to overstretch the scar tissue. Slowly but surely was the trick, and she wasn't to neglect the healing slav. As she crossed the courtyard for her lesson with Master Shonagar, the fire lizards appeared in the air. Beauty landed on her shoulder, broadcasting images of the lovely swim in the lake and how warm the sun had been on the flat rock. Murga had evidently been with them, for Beauty projected a second golden queen on the rocks. They were all in good spirits. Master Shonagar had not moved. One thick fist upheld the heavy head on the supporting arm. His other arm was cocked, hand on thigh. At first, Melanie thought he was asleep. So you return to me after singing. At the gather? Wasn't I supposed to sing? Melanie halted so abruptly in her astonishment at the reprimand in his voice that Beauty chirped in alarm. You are never to sing without my express permission. The massive fist connected with the tabletop. But the Master Harper himself... Is Master Robington your voice instructor, or am I? The bellowed question rocked her back on her heels. You I, sir. You are, sir. I only thought. You thought. I do the thinking while you're my student. And you will remain my student for some time, young woman, until your voice is properly trained for your duties as a harper. Do I make myself clear? Yes, sir, 
I'm very sorry, sir. I didn't know I was disobeying. Well, and his tone abruptly modified to one of such benevolence that Melanie again stared in disbelief. I hadn't exactly mentioned that I didn't consider you ready to sing in public yet, so I accept your apology. Melanie gulped, grateful for the reprieve. You didn't, all things considered, perform too badly yesterday, he went on. You heard me? Of course I heard you. The fist landed on the table, though with less force than the previous thump. I hear every singing voice in this hall. Your phrasing was atrocious. I think we'd better go over that song now so that you can correct your interpretation. He heaved a sigh of profound resignation. You will undoubtedly be obliged to sing it again in public. That's obvious, since you wrote it. And it is undeniably popular. So you might as well just learn to sing it well. Now we shall start with the breathing exercises. And we can't, another crash on the sand table, do that when you're halfway across the hall and trembling all over. I won't eat you, girl, he added in the gentlest of voices he had yet used in her presence. But I will, and his tone took a stoner note, sterner note, teach you to make the most of your voice. Although the lesson began with a totally unexpected scolding, Melanie left Master Shonagar's presence with a feeling of considerable accomplishment. They had gone over the fire lizard song phrase by phrase, occasionally accompanied by Beauty's trilling. By the end of the session, Melanie stood in further awe of Master Shonagar's musical acrium. He had drawn from her melody every possible nuance and shading of tone, heightening its total impact. Tomorrow, Master Shonagar said as he dismissed her, dismissed her, bring me a copy of that latest thing you wrote, the one about Brecky. At least you have wit enough to write music you can sing. That lies in the best part of your voice. Tell me, do you do that on purpose? No, no, that was an indivious question, unworthy of me, inapplicable to you. Away with you now, I'm excessively wearied. His fist came up to support his head, and he was snoring before Melanie could express her gratitude for his stimulating lesson. Beauty flew to her perch on Melanie's shoulder, chittering happily, and Melanie began to feel as weary as Master Shonagar claimed to be, absently checking to see where her other friends were. As usual, they were sunning on the rooftops, where they had undoubtedly remained until feeding time. Melanie entered the hall, wondering if she should ask Sylvina about boots. But she could hear a lot of bustle and noise from the kitchen and decided to bide her time. She made her way to the room and saw the door ajar and was surprised to find Odiva waiting for her. I took you at your word, Melanie, but honestly, if I had to stay one warm moment in that poisonous atmosphere, I meant it. 
You look tired. Master Shonagar's lessons are exhausting. We only have one in the week. And you have to go every day? Was he in one of his banging moods? A diva giggled and her eyes sparkled with merriment. Melanie laughed too. I sang yesterday at the gather without his express permission. Oh, great stars! A diva was torn between giggles and concern. But why would he complain? You sang so beautifully. Viridian said it was the best he'd heard this that sea song done. You've made another good friend in Viridian, if that's any consolation. That fist in Benis's face. He's wished so often that he could bang with that arrogant booby. Adiva, could Lord Sangal of Bull make Master Robington? You don't pay heed to that spiteful wary Brilla. Oh, Melanie. But can an apprentice, an apprentice, an ordinary apprentice, yes, Adiva said with a reluctant, a reluctant sigh for the truth, because apprentices have no rank. Journeymen do, but you are Master Robington's own special apprentice, just as Pimer said, and it'd take more than a Lord Holder to shift Master Robington when he's made up his mind. Besides, you weren't at fault. Pona was, bearing false witness. Now you listen to me, Melanie. Don't you dare let that bunch of sly slippers worry you. They're just jealous. That was Pona's problem, too. Besides... And Adiva's face brightened as she thought of the telling argument. Lord Garrosh needs you here to help him train Murga. There's your new song. Oh, Melanie, Telmer was playing it, and it's the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. Live for my living or else I must die. A diva had a throaty contralto voice that throbbed poignantly on the deep note. I wanted to weep, and, well, I know I'm just a silly girl. You're not silly. You stood up for me against Pona. A diva bit her lip guiltily, her expression contrite. I didn't tell you about Master Dominic's first message. She paused, full of self-reproach. I knew about it. I heard him tell Dunka. We all did. And I know they were trying to make trouble for you because you had the fire lizards. But you told Master Dominic that I hadn't been told. Fair's fair. Well then, if fair's fair, you did stand up with me against Pona and all those fosterlings when it really mattered. Let's forget everything else and just be friends. I've never had a girlfriend before, Melanie added shyly. You haven't? Adiva was shocked. Weren't you fostered out? No, being the youngest and half circle being so isolated and with thread falling. And that's what the harper usually does. And Petteron never. Just as well old Petteron kept you by him the way things turned out, isn't it? A diva grinned. But we're friends now, aren't we? 
and they sealed the bargain with a handshake. Are they really practicing my song? asked Melanie, a little apprehensive. Yes, and hating every minute of it because you wrote it. A diva was delighted. I'd be obliged if you teach me some of the simpler chords than the ones you've written. I cannot get my hands. They are simple. For you, maybe, but not for me, Adiva groaned over her inadequacy. Here, and Melanie thrust her guitar at Adiva, you can start with a simple E chord. Go on, strum it. Now modulate to an A minor. Melanie soon realized that she didn't have much, have as much patience as she ought to with Odiva, especially since Odiva was her best friend now, and she currently did try to follow Melanie's instructions. But both girls were relieved when Beauty's creeling interrupted the practice. Adiva declared that she'd have to fly to change before supper. She wouldn't have time after, or she'd be late to rehearsal. She gave Melanie a quick and grateful embrace and dashed down the steps ahead of her. Camel and Pimer were waiting for Melanie at the kitchen level. It seemed incredible to Melanie as she fed her hungry fire lizards, that she'd only been at the Harper Hall a seven day. So much had happened, and yet the fire lizards had settled in as if they'd never lived anywhere else. She had established a routine in her sessions with Dominic and the journeyman in the mornings, with Shonagar in the afternoon. Above all, she had the right, the ex exquisitely sweet right, no, an injunction from the Master Harper to write the songs that had once been totally forgiven, forbidden her. Seven days ago, standing in this very courtyard, She'd been scared to tears. What had Tegelian said? Yes, he'd given her the seven day to get adjusted. And he'd been right in that, although she doubted him at the time. He'd also said that she didn't have anything to fear from Harper's. True enough that she had experienced envy and to some extent overcome it. She'd made staunch friends and good impressions on those in the hall and hold who mattered in her future. She'd made not one, but several places for herself in the craft hall with her songs, her fire lizards, and unexpectedly her knowledge of sea craft. Only one small worry nagged at her. What if the vengeful Pona could prejudice her grandfather, Lord Sangle, against a lowly apprentice in the craft hall? Not all Lord Holders were tolerant men like Lord Garrosh. Not all of them had fire lizards. Melanie had had too much stripped from her before in her home hold to calm her anxiety. And that, my dear friends, is the end of chapter 10. Just one more page, one more chapter to go. So, we had... Some more time at the uh, at the uh, gather, 
and they seemed to have a fantastic time. Melanie got to sing not once, but twice. She kept getting pulled onto the dance floor by, well, a lot of different people. Masters, journeymen, and of course, Pimer. She got to speak with Lord Garage, and he seemed to, um, he seems to like her. Sorry, Miss Skitter, always, when she gets up, she has trouble getting up, and it takes a bit to get her moving. She wants to move faster than her, uh, old body will allow, so I have to help her sometimes. But hey, it was nice to have the little old lady, lady with us for the entirety of the uh, recording. I honestly thought she wouldn't join us because she had been sleeping just a few moments before I started recording. <sighs> so I think I'm right about an hour and a half for this video, maybe just a little bit longer. Of course, I won't know for sure once I start editing. And with a few chapters ahead of this one, it will take me a little bit to edit it all. But the good news is, you guys aren't going to have to wait. It will be posted up. Um, I know I haven't done Sword of Shannara yet, and I think today is... What is the date today? Today is the... Uh, well, today is the day I'm supposed to put out a chapter of that, and I haven't read any of it in several days. Actually, I've got to pull it out of my bag because I have I took the book with me to the hospital last week so that I could just read on ahead and see where the chapter goes. Um, better wrap this up because they're vacuuming in the hallways. I just want to thank all of you for being here. If you want to give a like, comment, sub subscribe, I would very much appreciate it. You guys are fantastic, though. If if all you're here is to read my stories, read read me, listen to me read these stories, I very much appreciate it. I wish you all a great morning, afternoon, evening, whatever time it is for you. And I hope everything goes well. Thanks. Bye-bye.